that's a beautiful example of how the arts and sciences can really, you know, uh, work together to really help, you know, share science and, and how cool science is. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Podger. Coral reefs are among the most iconic of seascapes and home to an estimated 25% of marine species. Hidden among the reefs in protected or concealed microhabitats are a variety of creatures we call cryptofauna. Our guest today is Paul Sickle, a research professor at University of Miami's Rosenthal School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science, who has spent his career studying the tiny creatures that call reefs home and discovered two previously unreported species of isopods along the way. Professor Sickle, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. How did you become interested in marine ecology? Ah, okay. So uh, when I was a child, I used to watch a lot of uh, Jacques Cousteau films and uh, other nature programs. Uh, we always watched Sea Hunt. And um, <laughs> I also used to go uh, camping a lot. My parents were avid campers. And so we would go to the mountains, the beach, um, the desert, whatever, that I would, you know, look at, you know, creatures and collect them. And so I was really into creatures. And uh, up until about seventh grade, you know, I had sort of this dual fascination with with uh, ocean, the ocean and with reptiles, creepy <laughs> crawlies, you know. And uh, I was kind of leaning toward being coming a herpetologist. But then I I uh, took a, a stroke playing class, a freediving class at the local YMCA when I was in seventh grade. And I, you know, circled in kelp forests. And, you know, from my, you know, experience working with reptiles, whenever I try to watch them, they would like, if they see me, they'd run away, like, you know, lizards. Um, and, but the fish didn't like, they just like would just come around and just like, who cares? You know, it's like, wow, this is so cool. I could get like right up next to them and watch them and they don't care. So, uh, it's like that point on, I switched. It's like, I want to do this. And so, yeah, that was, I was just focused on, on doing that from that point on and, and never looked back. Uh, how did you, uh, kind of focus in on studying Nathan's? Ah, uh, that's a, a fun story as well. So, I was originally trained as a sort of a fish behavioral ecologist. My my early training was actually on sharks. Uh, when I was undergraduate, I worked with uh, two uh, great shark biologists at Scripps. And uh, then for my own uh, master's and doctoral work, I wanted to work on smaller fish. So I worked on Garibaldi, uh, which is now the California State Marine Fish. Uh, it stays put in the same place its whole life and really easy to study. So I studied you know, their, their mating behavior. Uh, and then when I uh, left um, the West Coast and um, I went to Barbados for a postdoc, um, I sort of took that to the same research questions that I was asking with Garibaldi about uh, meat choice and parental care and those kinds of things to uh, Caribbean um, damsel fish. So I was in the water every single day uh, for months at a time at, at that time from about, you know, five o'clock in the morning until maybe 6.30 or seven, watching these fish spawn. And then I noticed that at dawn, the females were taking a break from spawning and visiting uh, clearing stations that were they were occupied by cleaner gobies at dawn near the male's territory. It's like, why are you doing this? You know, why, are, why don't you just like wait till the spawning's all done and then tend to your, your cleaning? And so I thought whatever it was that was causing this behavior uh, must be really important, uh, and it must be happening about that time of day. So I started looking into you know, what it is that these cleaner fish are eating, and I contacted my colleague in Australia who works on cleaner fish, and some who work on cleaner fish in the Caribbean. And it turns out they were they eat these things, or they primarily eat these things called mated isopods, and these are these are tick-like um, you know crustaceans that hop on the fish. They take a blood meal and then they hop off. And if you cut open you know, the gut of a cleaner goby or a cleaner wrasse, uh, they're chock full of these things. It's like popcorn. That's what they eat. They're eating these things off of these fish. And so I thought, okay, so I wonder what time of day they're active, you know? And so I started looking at what time of day they're active. And of course, they're most active at night and at dawn. So these fish were waking up at dawn with these nathids on them and going to the cleaning station uh, and getting them removed by the by the cleaner fish. It was important enough for them that they were willing to interrupt spawning uh, to, to do this. And so from then, I just started, you know, looking into like what's known about, you know, marine parasites in general from an ecological perspective, and especially, you know, the nathod isopods. And very little, very few people in the world were working on 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 these things. And so it's like, well, you know, this is, this is wide open. 
So I started, you know, along that path. And because I was among the few in the world working on it, you know, we sort of were able to take whatever direction we wanted. And so, you know, yeah, that's the, that I, I, I figured it'll be maybe a year or two detour into that <laughs> realm of the, you know, of, of the microfauna, the parasites. And then I get back to, you know, spawning behavior, but it never happened. It just kept going. <laughs> and, you know, 20 years later, here I am. <laughs> um, can, can you tell me a little bit about what the Nathan life cycles plays out as like the, uh, the kind of older age version does something that's interesting yeah, or so unusual it, it, it is what me. makes it really hard to study, even for, for people who specialize in parasites, because their, their life cycle is just really bizarre. Um, and so they're only parasitic in the juvenile or larval stage. And that's the stage that most people come in contact with. You catch a fish and you happen to see one on the fish, it's the larval stage. Um, and so, you know, it's easy to think that the larval stage, and then if you find an adult, that those are like completely different organisms. But uh, so they go through these three uh, larval stages. Uh, they feed at each stage, stage one, two, three. Uh, they take a blood meal from a fish. They go to the bottom, uh, spend some time there, molt to the next stage, feed again, molt, feed again, molt. After the third molt, they become adults, male or female. And the adults don't feed on anything. They just live in the substrate, in the rubble, or in sponge, wherever they can find a place to hide. They live in there, uh, they reproduce, and they die. That's it. Uh, yet, the, you know, the, the, the challenge is that the taxonomy is based on the males, but the ecologically important stage is the, are the juveniles. And so mm-hmm. getting that, making that connection is really, uh, really challenging, especially since you're getting so few people in the world you know, work on these. Do you know how long they live? It depends on uh, on the location. So uh, in, in the okay. tropics where we work, it's it's roughly a month. If they're lucky enough okay. to complete a full life cycle, roughly a month. But there's been some work done on ones in the Antarctic, um, you know, about a few years ago, uh, where they appear to live like two years. Uh, it takes two years to complete their, be their life cycle. So that cold water, you know, slows them down. <laughs> so uh, yeah, in the tropics, it's pretty short. Um, you, you mentioned being able to see them on fish or potentially being able to see them on fish. What sort of size scale are we talking about? Uh, one to three millimeters. Typically there are a few, few bigger ones that get, they get a, a bit bigger than that, maybe seven or eight millimeters, but the majority of them are, are between one and three millimeters. Um, what is their role in the kind of marine ecosystem food web? <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, one obvious one in, in, in coral reef systems, at least, is they're, they're, they're the broker between the cleaner fish and the client. Mm-hmm. You know, they, that the irritation that they cause, you know, encourages the client to go to the cleaner, and the cleaner gets its meal, and then all kinds of other interactions take place from that. Right, the fish, you know, hanging around a certain spot will release waste products, so that contributes to you know nutrient loads, um, and there's contact between the the cleaner fish and the client that can influence uh, the microbiome. Um, so there's just that. But then also, um, you know, there are other things that eat them as well. And we're really just starting to get a handle on that. And so if you think about what they feed on, they're feeding on fish blood, and yet they're being eaten by by smaller things, uh, many of which bigger fish actually eat. And so it's kind of like having a super predator, like maybe a, a really big fish or a shark eating another fish. But then that thing being eaten by something else, which is like mind boggling, you know, but they just do a little bit at a time. So they're basically feeding uh, you know, the little, little fish that eat them or even the corals that eat them um, are essentially feeding on fish blood. So it's a ba- another way that, that fish uh, biomass, fish, new fish uh, yeah, tissue essentially works its way through the ecosystem, um, you know, just aside from being eaten by bigger fish. Did I catch that right? That coral themselves can eat them? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we have some really nice video of of, uh, of that. Well, I'll, I'll have to bug you for that afterwards. Yeah, uh, you can do that. Um, so, t- to my understanding, you've discovered or reported for the first time two different varieties of these that were otherwise unknown previously. Is it rare to discover a new species? Um, yes. Dep- yes, depending on the spe- on the group of organs you're working with, if you're working on big things, you know that everybody sees. Yeah, it's extremely rare. But when you're working on little things, the the cryptofauna that are hidden that people almost never see, it's really it's really not. So pretty much every place we go, we expect to find at least one new one. 
um, you know, given that given the um, that how few people you know know how to look for them, um, it's just sort of a, a gold mine. You're just looking through you know a big treasure chest of stuff, and well, odds are you're free to find something cool. And so yeah, so if you're if you're working on things that few other people work on, the chances of finding things that are undescribed are are pretty high. If you're working on things that a lot of people have worked on, then it's much lower. Now, in both these cases, you ended up naming them after well-known, famous people. Um, can you talk a little bit about the procedure for naming new critters and kind of what was the reaction from the family or the people that you named them after? Yeah, good question. So the procedure is that once you think that you have something that's new to science, then you sort of look in the literature and you compare it with what's known. Uh, and that will, you know, as you tell you, yeah, this is, this is different than all the rest or, or it's not. And part of that process is you get to choose the name. Typically, it's, it's very rare to find uh, something that's in a completely new um, genus or, or family. Sometimes it happens, but it's rare. But, it's, but uh, it's much more common that you find something that's in a known genus, but the species has not been described as not, as not known. So you get to pick the species name. And so the, the rules of that are pretty, pretty flexible, although historically, most people have named things after either some characteristic of the organism, maybe like a unique color pattern or structure, or, or where they found it, or maybe after another scientist who works on those, those things. Um, but there's no rule against naming it after you know, a musician or, or, or anyone else. You just have to explain why it is that you chose that name. It's a section in the in the paper that you submit called the etymology, and that's the section where you explain why you chose that name. And so we, you know, we we honor you know some musicians that we we really like and that we listen to a lot while we're doing our work and have historically been influential uh, to us. And it was our way as scientists to honor their work as as artists. And uh, yeah, we play within the within the rules. And uh, the nice, the thing about it that um, that I like is that it really helps generate these kinds of conversations. So you know, I'm here sharing this um, this chat with you about these organisms that no one else is most of you have never heard of, because you know it was named after someone that has name recognition. And that's a beautiful example of how the arts and sciences can really you know uh, work together to really help you know share science and, and how cool science is. So I have to say that for the uh, Navy of Marley I White, which is the first one we named after uh, Bob Marley, the overwhelming um, response internationally was positive. Like, this is so cool that you did this. But there were a few people who were actually offended by it because they, they thought that we were implying that, you know, that Bob Marley was a parasite mm. or not. But through that, we engaged those people in a conversation about how things are named. And, um, and, and the, the, sort of the process, like one person asked, why don't you name a lion after Bob Marley? It's like, well, I didn't discover why I can't, I don't have that option. I can't do it. Uh, but I get, you know, engaged in this whole conversation with, with some of these people about the process and about, you know, how it's actually an honor and how parasites really aren't mm. bad. They're, they're super important in the ecosystem and they represent, you know, at least half of the organisms on the planet, they're super successful and important. But they got a bad rap because you know, in in certain settings, they you know they're problematic. Um, and so we had these conversations, and and to the person, every all the people that contacted me, they were upset, understood it, and they they said thank you for explaining that to me. I really didn't know how that worked, and I'm sorry that you know I got upset. And if you're ever in this you know, part of the of the world, stop by and we'll have a beer. So it ended up being this really positive thing. And one of the, the best things that come out of this was that through that, I met a friend of mine, uh, Amlok Tafari, who plays bass for Steel Pulse. And we were we overlapped in a hotel lobby uh, in St. Martin. I was there for a meeting and he was there you know, for a concert performance. And he heard that there was some guy who named um, a new species after Bob Marley. And, and he told the person who saw you that he wanted to meet this person. And so she said, well, it turns out that uh, he's going to be here tonight. So, um, you know, we met and we chatted and he filled um, our conversation and we had this whole conversation about, you know, naming species and the importance of, you know, parasites and ecosystems and ecosystems in general and, and about the importance of art science collaborations, like this whole thing. 
And so we've been working together for the past decade now. Um, and our first discussion is actually, um, NSF actually posted that on their website. So you can, you can find that at discussion that we have. Yeah. I think it's still on YouTube. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, has Jimmy Buffett responded? Yeah. Yeah. So he said, <laughs> it said it has a nice ring to it. And, uh, <laughs> and we made it, you know, when we, when we, uh, sort of issued the initial press release, we made sure that we indicated there clearly that we are in no way, uh, likening these people to parasites that's we're not doing that um and so i think that that's sort of like cut off that whole that whole whole notion yeah right historically it's an honorific it's 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 not a, a character yeah, yeah i mean all species are cool <laughs> and all species do things that people think are oh that's kind of gross but if you think about like how how a predator eats its prey and right. it kills it right the parasite doesn't do that it just takes a little tax you know it just takes a little little bit of tissue <laughs> to do its thing but it doesn't doesn't kill it unless it's you know have, you have a bunch of them on you. But for the most part, I you know, I find editors which which people view as very charismatic as you know much worse um, than parasites because <laughs> it lead lead to the death of the thing that they're eating. So the the last kind of area I wanted to ask you about is we've seen a lot of reports lately about the heat waves that are going on yeah. in the area, and I I was wondering what's like the immediate impacts you're seeing of that are and kind of more long-term what climate change impacts you've been seeing. Yeah. So um, we did some experiments in uh, Australia and in the Philippines looking at the thermal tolerance of, of these organisms actually and found that, you know, once you get even just a, a degree or two above the average, um, they, 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 the mortality rate increases really quickly. And so if you think about it, you know, they have, they, they, they feed their, their meal and the, the, you know, the warmer the temperature, the faster that gets metabolized and used up. And then they've got a, a limited amount of time before they can have to find another host and refeed. Um, if it's cooler, you know, that, that last meal lasts longer. And if it's warm, it doesn't last very long. Uh, so that, and just the, the overall effect of the temperature on their physiology, um, we found that, uh, it, 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 it based on much higher mortality rates uh, as the temperature increases above normal for these things. And then in the field, uh, we have the opportunity uh, through some long-term monitoring we've been doing in Australia to uh, look at the, the abundance of these organisms uh, during um, bleaching events when the water's very warm. And we found that during the bleaching events themselves, when the water's super warm, the populations of the naphids uh, plummet. Um, mm -hmm. And then Afterwards, when there's all kinds of dead coral, um, which is paradise for them, then their populations, you know, rocket back up. So, um, you know, I expect that, you know, similar, something similar would happen, um, you know, in the, in, in, in this situation where, um, because they, they, they get swim in short bursts, but not very long distances and they have no pelagic dispersal phase. So, so they really can't, you know, swim far enough to get into cooler water. So they're, you know, they're probably going to be those ones in shallow water are going to be, be killed. Can you talk about how NSF funding has impacted your career? Oh, yeah. It's been a, a total, you know, game changer. And, you know, there's no way we could have done this stuff with, without that funding. And we're really grateful that they, that they saw the significance of working on these kinds of organisms, these sort of hidden things that, that people overlook. Uh, and they, they understood that these were really important to the, the ecosystem and that you know, there are so few people working on them that, you know, we were worthy of, uh, of their support. And so we've been, we've been fortunate to have uh, support from them. Uh, so at least, you know, about 12 years now running. And uh, so, yeah, so it's just been a complete game changer and I'm, I'm so grateful for, uh, for their support um, uh, for our work. What is next for you? That's a really good question. And that's really what I love most about science is you never really know if your <laughs> eyes are open, you don't know, you know, it's whatever, whatever like presents itself, you know, something really cool comes along or you look at the data set and you find something really cool. It's like, Oh, that is neat. Let's follow that. So I really don't know. Um, <laughs> we are right now we're, we're doing some work with, um, with cleaner fish and microbiomes uh, with colleagues at Woods Hole uh, and in Portugal um, looking at how, you know, the contact between cleaner and client might influence the microbiome exchange. 
Um, so going back to how we got into parasites in the first place by the cleaner, cleaner fund interaction. Uh, then we also have um, a, a new uh, NSF grant uh, looking at the, the diversity of Nathan isopods, like going around the world in coral reef systems and just finding out what species are there. Um, so that's what our, you know, our current funding is. Um, after that's done, then, you know, uh, it's wherever the data uh, leads us. Um, but yeah, so for right now, it's, uh, yeah, the, the main focus um, is on uh, getting handled the biodiversity. You think about there's, you know, 135 species roughly that have been described in the whole world. And it's, yeah, given how prone these things are to speciation, given their life cycle, you know, we're, we're nowhere close to having a handle on, on how many there are. Well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing all of that with My me. My pleasure. I really appreciate cool. uh, what you do. I think what you do is really the most important part of, of science because, you know, the role of scientists is to make discoveries and then share it with the broader sort of human tribe. Um, but, you know, people like you are the ones who, who make that connection. You know, they take what we do and share it with the, you know, everybody else, everybody, the whole society whole tribe can benefit from it. it doesn't just stay within the scientific realm so i really appreciate the kind of work that you do it's extremely valuable special thanks to paul sickle for the discovery files i'm nate potker discover how the u.s national science foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov